Hello from Houston. This is Roger D with Texas Tea, where I bring on entrepreneurs, hustlers, and prodigies so they can spill the drama-free tea on how they became successful. And today's guest is an absolute advocate of two great things, the outdoors and good music. They tend to go pretty well together. Uh, he realized that living a pretty wild lifestyle wasn't really conducive to having some sort of stereo around. So out of necessity, they made uh, pretty much the uh, indestructible speaker. And, uh, at, and now, after that, they've uh, allowed someone like yourself to be the hero coming to the beach with the turtle box. Today's guest, Will Bradley, one of the founders. Guys, good to meet you. Glad to be here, Roger. Glad to have you on, man. Yeah, buddy. Making heroes out of... Out of average consumer, of... <laughs> right? This, this, is, uh, this is the guy that does it, Turtle yeah. Box. So yeah, man. This has been a labor of love for us for the last seven years. Uh, we started in my garage seven years ago, built the first one out of necessity, and broke everything that was out there. Yeah. Um, everything that claimed to be loud, I bought it, broke it. Um, we were, you know, said we we're living a wild lifestyle, mostly outdoors, uh, adventurous lifestyle is what I would call it. And yeah. we broke everything. I mean, nothing could live up to all the adventures we were doing, mostly on the water. And, and, uh, so this is how the, the turtle box was born. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, like you said, it was out of necessity. Yeah. And, uh, that's kind of an interesting business startup because most people start a business and they have a product in mind to market to a large group sure, yeah. you were like i want this for me and then yeah. you're like oh shit other people like this too so if you have someone listening that's kind of in that scenario where they do it for themselves they have mm. they have no idea of how they're going to turn this into something scalable what would be your biggest advice for someone venturing in like that yeah so the first one wasn't really meant to be a business it was meant for me personally and uh, my roommates at the time we all kind of fell in love with this turtle box the first one did not look like this <laughs> it looked very much garage made but, i did i saw that uh but it was still loud it still was waterproof and um it did look similar to this and uh you know probably a year of using it and it, being around friends and family people wanted to buy it mm -hmm. like, oh you know maybe there's a business here and one of my now partners i was like maybe we should turn this into a business and that kind of launched a long very long process of yeah. uh building it out of our garage we built and sold the first 50 out of our garage i mean and it took a long it took us about a day just to build one wow. I mean, four of us i mean it's a lot of work didn't make any money on the first 50 but we did kind of prove the concept we sold them for about 350 dollars mm -hmm. and there was a huge market for it we realized and so that took us to okay how do we mass manufacture this thing how do we you know, raise capital around it. How do we do tooling? And it was a lot of things that none of us knew how to do. We were each in different industries, um, but all capable businessmen. So we kind of, you know, put our thinking hats on and figured out how to get it to the next step. And um, so to go back to your question, for guys that have an idea and maybe want to figure out how to scale it, you know, I would say pre Turtle Box, I used to think a business was all about the idea. The idea was the most important thing. You know, now seven years later, I realized that the idea, although important, is not the biggest thing. The, the idea is maybe 10%. It's the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's what starts the business. You know, you can't have a good business without a good idea. Um, so I do love uh, products that are born out of necessity. But, you know, launching it, marketing it, raising the capital around it, um, you know, finding the right partners to, you know, to go to battle with you. I mean, that's the, that's the really hard part. Um, you know, and I think you grow up, you see all these TV shows of like, uh, guys that came up with, you know, this really easy product. Like, Oh, if only I had had that idea, you know, yeah. then I'd be the multimillionaire or whatever. But, you know, you never see kind of underneath the water, you know, the rest of the iceberg that's under there, all the hard work and all the labor of love and how many times they failed. And, you know, how many times we, you know, every little part on this little thing, I mean, I can tell you hours of, of conversations and backs and forth and, you know, to get every little thing on it right and different points that have failed that we had to go back and redo. And, you know, so it's, it's a long, like I said, we started seven years ago. We officially launched uh, two and a half years ago to oh, wow. 
to the public. Um, you know, there's four years before that that nobody sees of yeah. all, you know, a lot of hard work. Um, so anyway, that's a long roundabout way of answering your question. No, but. no, that's a, that's a really good answer. Cause I think, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head that people just assume if they figure out the next turtle box sure, that yeah. it's just going to sell itself. And, um, I think a lot of people don't realize that even if a product is super popular and super needed, like if it's a not out in front of the people that want it right. and, and B not working the way it's supposed to, then it's just like, and then yeah. you have everything behind that as well. So um, I think that's good advice, man. Yeah. And I love products born out of necessity. I think, you know, you're, you are the best test market. You know, if mm -hmm. there's something that you need that's not out there, you know, that's, that's probably the right idea versus trying to like find a, ha you know, a gap in the marketplace that doesn't exist. It's easiest to find something that you need and, and something that you know well. I mean, granted, none of us were in the electronics or speaker business, but we were all, we we're all outdoorsmen. You know, we all love music, whether it's going to concerts. One of my partners is a great musician also, but we love listening to music. And when we're outdoors, music was just kind of a natural fit. You know, we're always, you're around a campfire or you're on a, you're on a boat. I mean, listening to music just makes the outdoor experience that much oh, yeah. better. And so, uh, you know, that was a big hole in the marketplace. And at the time, I mean, seven years ago, the market looked a little bit or a lot different than it does now. But, you know, most of the products were really just indoor speakers that they made portable. Um, you know, they weren't really built to handle the outdoor elements. And so, um, you know, to me, that was kind of an anomaly. I didn't really understand that. It was like, yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so anyway. I remember specifically uh, going camping with uh, my mom and my stepdad. And I probably can count past my hands how many times i saw speakers get kicked oh yeah <laughs> yeah and just like because they're just laying around and then right. you know then it's destroyed and you know you don't have any music out there and this is i guess in the 90s so not as exciting i couldn't amazon drop it <laughs> you know to uh some way place close so now yeah. it's just you know now you have to talk amongst yourself and who wants to talk right no I'm kidding <laughs> yeah no it's it's a different market than it was in the nineties for sure. Yeah. Right. Which is which is crazy how far we've come to that point. But man, it, I feel like uh I feel like what you guys have brought, like you said, was even though of necessity for yourself, really did solve a problem. And I actually uh the guest I just had on before this one, similar situation, more because of COVID pushed the necessity for um for quicker cleaning of, of locations. Mm -hmm. Uh where he didn't he didn't necessarily create it for his own needs, but he he saw saw the needs there. So you guys had it firsthand. Consumer is probably a lot easier to see firsthand. Yeah, sure. And um, so that first one you said the first four and a half years, by the way. So you built the first one and then you're building them, and they were mostly breaking even. Uh, I'm guessing that at that point you guys were doing this. I wouldn't say part time, but this is not your full time for the first four and a half years. Yeah, and it's been. We've, you know, pretty much had full-time jobs during this whole process. This was kind of a side business for all of us, um, you know, until really the last year or so. We've had two of our partners quit their full-time jobs and do this full-time. Um, you know, it's become a full-time baby for all of us. It's, it's uh, you know, really taken off over yeah. this last year. Um, you know, we launched direct to consumer, and so, you know, it's kind of harder getting the word out. We launched on Indiegogo. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's kind of like Kickstarter. Yeah, it sounds familiar. And, uh, you know, it's like crowdfunding, although it's technically not a way to really raise capital. It's really more of a way to pre-sale your product. Gotcha. Uh, so you can take some money now for a discount. So we think we sold them $70 off or something like that. And you take their money and then you deliver the product, you know, 90 days later or 180 days later. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just kind of the nature of the business. But it was a great way to kind of make a big splash in the marketplace and launch. So, yeah. Yeah. So you got is like kind of baked in marketing uh, in that initial part. Yeah. I mean, so one cool thing about our product is we believe every turtle box kind of has the ability to sell another 10 turtle boxes because, it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like a stationary object like your sunglasses or something. I mean, it's, you know, it's loud. It goes with you and it, it naturally draws attention to it. And so we wanted to launch like the first, the first 
order was just 500 units and to us that was a huge number and you know now those 500 go like that but the first you know the first 500 was a yeah you know it was a little bit scary for us and yeah. um and so how many units are you moving on a monthly basis now uh it just depends on the month we've sold about 10,000 units over the last couple of years so oh, wow. um you know the first year was a little slow not slow it's slower than it is now and um, you know, I think with the COVID pandemic, it actually, we were worried would totally stop our business. It, it did in March, then it, in April, it kind of just took off. Um, yeah. you know, I think people realized they're going to be sitting in their backyards for a while. So they started <laughs> investing in their backyards yeah. and their summer, you know, road trip adventures and, and, um, pre-plan. Yeah. And so, you know, COVID is actually, um, I don't want to say good, been good for us. It's been good for sales. We sold mm -hmm. out, um, you know, this summer we sold about a year's worth of inventory. Oh wow! In June, yeah, in June alone, and so, you know, we kind of came up with an inventory crunch this summer. Started pre-selling units. Finally got back in stock uh, in August, and now we're you know kind of ramping up for the Christmas season. Um, but you know, we've had supply chain issues just like everybody has this year with yeah. with, with the pandemic, and um, we're trying to work around that and with a lot more exposure. You know, we've We've gotten a lot of good press and PR, and so trying to, you know, plan for that is is a little hard around the pandemic. So yeah, um, but it's been good, good problem to have. Oh yeah, of course. And I have a man, I have a myriad of offshoot questions here, but but yeah. we'll 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 start with the pandemic so we can get that yeah. out of the way. So supply chain problems. Uh, where are your parts? Are are they all coming from domestic, or are they coming from no, overseas? No, we, we've tried to make them here. We we do. You know, we're based out of Texas, so all the designing, prototyping, our repairs and warranties and uh, product testing all happen in Texas locally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's if it's an electronic speaker type component, it's coming from China. Uh, yeah, it's kind of the necessary evil. And with all this trade wars with China, we've We've tried to move it. I've tried to move it to Mexico and different places, yeah. but at the end of the day, all the components coming from China, regardless. Um, I think we may. How come that's the case in this they've industry? They've just there used to be Taiwan used to have a big presence in the speaker business, but kind of everything's moved to China. Mm. Um, they're trying to change that now, but pretty much if you're buying a speaker, most likely it's ninety yeah. percent made in China. Um, so China has like a stranglehold on our music, man. They do on the speaker on the speaker side of it, you know, injection molding and some of those things we can get done here. Uh, and we have done injection molding in you know here locally in Texas. Oh, that's um, cool. Before, um, and we may try to move some pieces of that back. We're looking into that now, uh, but right now everything's from China. So you know the pandemic started in China. They were shut down in February, so we started. You know, it's been a little bit of a back and forth, but we were one of the first ones kind of getting our orders back in with them. Um, that's another reason why it took so long to get it manufactured. We tried to get it manufactured here early on, mm -hmm. and um, eventually, you know, all our manufacturing endeavors took us took us to China. You know, the only place really? that could get get this product done. Um, I think we could have got something um, less suitable to our goals mm -hmm. done here, like not as loud, not as efficient. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we we knew exactly what we wanted and didn't settle for less and. Yeah, uh, took a little bit longer and a little more money, but we got it done. Which is an interesting thought because most people associate manufacturing in China as cheaper. Yeah, it is. It's cheaper um, per unit cost for sure. Like we couldn't. Yeah, our unit cost to make this here in the U.S. would be what we sell it for today per oh, unit. Oh wow! So you know, there's no margin, uh, and they'd still be getting a lot of their components from from China. Um, wow, that's crazy. So, so you. So not only would it have to be a exceptionally higher price, but it would be yeah. in a roundabout way coming from there anyways. You'd be looking about a nine for the same product, about nine hundred dollars, but I'm not sure that it could get done uh, the way it is today. Um, there's some things that we do great here, um, and you know I'd love for the speaker business manufacturing side to move back to the United States, but yeah. I don't see that happening anytime soon. It might move. Yeah to Japan and we love, you know, we have a better trade relationship with them. So that would be good. But, you know, ideally long-term I'd like to get the injection molding pieces done here and more of the assembly process done here and still get more of our like electronic components mm. from there. And then we doing more of the assembly here and then we could control that process. 
Um, but yeah, for now, everything's everything's shining and probably will be for the next foreseeable future. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, hey man, understandable. You gotta you gotta have the vision of what you wanna have end product wise and, and I know a lot of people give flack on, on where it's coming from, but but when you're trying to give the best experience, you should just look always look globally, right? Yeah, I mean we kind of set our aim like, all right, we, this is what we want the product to be. We knew how loud we wanted it to be. Mm. And so that's ultimately what led us there. Um, you know, five years ago, this, this, this product didn't exist. So like trying to communicate that to somebody like, you know, we're, not, <laughs> we're not, we're not taking an off the shelf speaker. And people are like, people sometimes see it on Instagram. Like, Oh, you just took an off the shelf speaker and threw it in a box. Like, you know, we kind of wanted it to look that way. So keep the yeah. garage feel. Um, right. But, you know, everything's custom, custom to us. Um, you know, and everything on here is marine grade, like stainless steel. You know, we, we're 45 minutes from the coast, and so it's a very harsh environment. Like, yeah. you know, salt water just kills everything, much less 10 times more, you know, an electronics product. Like, salt water is so yeah. abusive and corrosive. So, so, um, so what's, the main, what's the main factor in the material that's keeping it from uh, getting destroyed in the Gulf? Um, rubber, plastic, you know, all the water, everything being watertight, not yeah. just, um, not just water resistant, but waterproof. And then, you know, all the metal surfaces are actually stainless and yeah. a titanium tweeter. So, you know, things that are kind of rust proof. And so, you know, I usually tell people treat it like a nice fishing pole or something. You want to just wash it off yeah. when you're done. Like if you take it down to the beach and it gets sandy and kind of salt spray on it, you know, hose it off when you get home and like you would a nice piece of gear mm -hmm. and so anyway what's a what's on the inside here on the actual like I, i'm not gonna butcher all the technicalities technical uh words there but like if it's hitting, hitting the front end my my first thought as a complete idiot when it comes to this yeah would be like it's going the uh, water's going through here how is that protecting the actual speaker yeah so the speaker it is actually, you know, it's a rubber surround, so everything is is watertight. And then we've got kind of like a, I mean, this looks you know, just like part of the grill, but it's actually a water kind of drain hole. Oh, so, okay, cool. You know, this can actually fill up and drain with water. Oh, wow. Um, you know, and these tight little little grill slits are actually just to protect something from, you know, if you're driving with on your Ranger or UTV, four-wheeler, whatever, like yeah. a branch or something would kind of, that's what the right. grill's for, kind of protect it. But, the puncture protection. I mean, yeah. Uh, but we actually have, I don't think we've ever had one return for a punctured speaker. So that actually does serve its purpose. Oh, wow. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. And uh, kind of rolling back to the original, because obviously there's been, I don't know how many iterations, but I'm assuming it's a lot of you guys testing different pieces. A lot of iterations back and forth. You know, you don't see that looking at the product. I can look at everything on here and remember yeah. every conversation we had, every... <laughs> every fight we had, you know, between yeah. partners like, oh, no, we need it this way. No, we need it this way. But, you know, I believe all of that back and forth really produced a great product. And, you know, our mission as a company is to produce the best, loudest outdoor speaker we can. Yeah. And my, my priorities are loudness, then, then ruggedness, um, you know, in, in terms of priority. Because uh, I think loudness is what really people want outdoors. Mm -hmm. You know, you get outside and nothing is really loud enough to hear over wind and yeah. waves and ocean and, you know, things might sound good indoors, but not necessarily outdoors. And so, you know, and if somebody was buying something for their living room, I would say, hey, go buy a Bose or a Sonos. But, yeah. you know, if you want something for your patio or on your lake house or on the beach, you know, nothing really stands up to this. We have our own kind of uh, sound curve for this product. And so it, it really does cut through wind and waves and you can, the sound travels. It actually sounds better sitting back about 20, 20 feet versus like, right up next to yeah, it. Yeah, I saw the disclaimer there. Yeah, yeah. So if you're, you know, I would never tell somebody, like, hold it right next to your <laughs> ear, but... Don't uh, carry it on your shoulder. Yeah, it's, it's meant to kind of almost act like a wakeboard tower speaker, you know, like okay. where they, they're up on the boat yeah. and they project a long ways. That's, that's kind of the idea behind this product is it's meant to fill an outdoor space. How did you test the uh, sound wave, you said? Yeah, the sound curve. And sound so, curve, um, that's the word. you know, there's different frequencies that carry better outdoors than others mm -hmm. and so uh, it's really our ears um we've a lot of playing with it a lot of a lot of different songs we have kind of what we call our 
Turtle Box test songs that yeah. we play. You know, some some are classical and some are like heavy metal. Some are rap, and you know, really making sure that one, it doesn't distort. Um, to see how we can hear it, and to see how it sounds outdoors, like twenty feet, thirty feet away. And so you're doing some actual in the field. Oh yeah, all the in time. the field. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, we, I mean, we do listen to it indoors, but you know, when, when we get a new sample in or something, and we're trying to tweak something, and we take it out outside, you know, even outside our office, you'll see us out in the parking lot, like holding up. <laughs> you know, you got the traffic going by, the freeways right there. It's loud, and like, you know, can we hear it? How does it sound? And uh, a lot of field test, a lot of field test. Yeah, well, I mean, you got to see it in live action, right? Yeah, yeah. How's the is, how's the actual like testing for durability? Are you guys like hitting it with shit? <laughs> so, yeah, so, the technical term, hitting yeah, it with shit. Yeah, no, we've hit it with all kind of stuff. Baseball bats, we've thrown it. Um, you know, at this point, you know, I still do a lot of stuff outdoors, mostly hunting mm -hmm. and fishing, and a lot of stuff off roading. And so, if, if we've got, you know. Rangers and UTVs, you know, we these actually are tie down straps features here, so you can tie it down to a boat or anything like that. Oh, okay. And so I've still got my original one from, you know, the first one off the factory line like yeah. forever ago, and just to see how it holds up over time. And I have beat it up. I mean, I take good care of it, like I would a fishing pole or something. I'll hose it down, but uh, I mean, it's really it's really held up well. I mean, it still plays like it did That's two and a half years ago, and it's got its it's got its own character now to it. So. Um, they hold up well. I mean, we have we have some customers that'll send them back, and there's like they're like, I don't know what happened to it, and we'll find like mud in the box, or you know, like in the, like, how did you even do that? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you know. Um, but no, for the most part, we've got some great great customers that you know really love us and have fallen in love with this product. It's cool to see. Yeah, and I'm guessing you have like a when you repair it, I guess it's like a hundred percent guarantee situation. Yeah, so uh, probably shouldn't say this over the podcast, but I've we've never turned a warranty down. Like we've we stand behind yeah. our product. You know, anybody that's had had an issue, we have taken care of them. Um, or that's a repair, and if we can't repair it, you know, we'll replace it. But you know, generally, we say a one year warranty. Most electronics. Like I just bought a new Apple computer. Only comes with a ninety day warranty. You know, yeah. and we've got an outdoor waterproof, you know, that's getting a lot more abuse. And yeah. We, and we offer a one year warranty. So for electronics, you know, that's unheard of. Nobody's doing that. Um, especially with this type of product, you know, there's just a lot of moving parts and, and things that can, can go wrong in these products, but we've really built them to last. You know, we've drop tested them. We've sprayed them with salt water. We've, you know, I've personally tested them for mm -hmm. two and a half years now. Um, you're patient so, zero. Yeah. Yeah. I am patient zero. And so they hold up, you know, I mean, I think there's always some one-off things that can happen. And you know, we've been amazed by the, all the different ways that people use these things, impressed by it, really. They, yeah. You know, they really do some cool stuff with these things. What's but, the most versatile application you've seen so far? Oh, man, we had, <laughs> we get all kind of crazy questions. We had one that was like a hot air balloon event, and they wanted to have 20 of them all <laughs> synced up at the same time when all these hot air balloons went off. And I was like, Oh, that's I don't know. I've never done that. We need to see if we can make it work, and that, um, you know, all all kind of cool stuff. But that's one that stands out to me. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Uh, you mentioned iPhone has ninety day. You guys have one year. You said yeah, one year. Yeah, yeah one year. Kind of no questions asked warranty, and then we've got sixty days. Hey, let let your ears be to be the judge. So we yeah, send you know I you can you. buy a box. I listened to it for fifty days. Didn't like it. So, you know, whatever no no reason needed yeah. send it back get your money back so uh, um and that rarely you, happens yeah. you know most people they buy it and they love it and uh you know occasionally somebody will find some reason that they want to send it back but usually a lot of times it's, they're doing something wrong like ah oh, it's not very loud i'm like well is your you know your phone turned up or is the box turned all the way up and so yeah, yeah. you know there's some customer uh service issues like that we got to work through and making sure that you know, they know what they're doing, know how to oh, sync yeah. it, make sure that, you know, sometimes you get on the phone and realize that your sound check is on and that can cause your box not to be playing all the way loud enough. And yeah, so, yeah. Um, anyway. But for the most part, it's 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 rugged enough for your initial one to, to go, what, we're going on three years, you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so unlike, you know, Apple, which is just churning and burning, man, uh, you guys are created a product that, 
you're essentially saying, hey, buy my product and you'll never have to buy a product again. How are you guys, right. or have you thought of how you guys are going to continue to sell to that customer base or, or add to that? Yeah, I mean, ideally, we'd love to say this is a lifetime product. Um, you know, like, kind of like Yeti would say, this is the last cooler you'll ever need. And granted, it's a cooler. It's two pieces of plastic and, you know, a hinge. Like, there's, you know, as long as you're decent to it, it's going to last you a lifetime. I mean, yeah. electronics, you know, I don't even have electronics that still work from my childhood, right? I mean, um, so, but that that is the idea. We want to, would love for this to be something that lasts you a lifetime. I mean, um, obviously, we can't warranty that yeah. uh, with an electronic product, but we built it in that way. You know, okay. We built it to last. Uh, we built it to kind of hold up to any adventure that the consumer would, would throw at it. Got um, you. So you're just assuming that Turtle Box is going to, to grow is just going to be continual acquisition of new customers. Yeah, um, I think it's two things. One, we want to acquire customers for a lifetime. You know, we're really looking for relationships, mm -hmm. not necessarily customers. Okay. Uh, you know, you, if you look on our Facebook or Instagram, you'll really see people that, that absolutely love the product. You know, they've, it's almost free advertising. They tag us. They want to be part of. Mm -hmm. kind of this movement you know it's just a cool it's a cool fun product um you know so i'd say we're after relationships more than customers and and offer them a good value a good experience you know our mission again is to make the best product we possibly can and so mm -hmm. you know as we move forward you know we'll keep making it louder keep making it more rugged you know as technology advances you know our product will advance and as things Got you. you know as as battery technology gets better you know our product will get get lighter it will last longer we'll get louder mm -hmm. so you're know, always looking That's to nice. improve the product you know so I, I think we'll see you know not okay. yearly but you know probably every every other year you know see a new iteration um, a little bit better a little bit louder uh, so and, and, and even this product you know there's slight improvements we've made you know even over different different iterations like the customer would know it looks the same but you know we've made it more waterproof and behind the scenes we've we've improved things yeah. and so you know that's an important thing in business you know is how do you keep making the best thing you possibly can whereas right. i think some that's a very <clears throat> a differentiator between our business and a lot of other businesses you know we're we're less profit focused right now um, we're most focused on making the best product we can mm. you know i think later down the line as we get bigger and and have um a little more buying power, you know, our margins can get better. We can buy more right. units. Um, you know, we can increase our order volume instead of buying, you know, a few thousand at a time. We can buy tens of thousands at a time and, you know, our margins will get better, but we're never going to sacrifice, you know, quality. Yeah. Um, and there's a million shortcuts we could have taken to get to this point, but, you know, it was, you know, seven years ago when we set out to make the best product we can, we, we set our goals and it was to, to be the mm -hmm. best, you know, and there's been lots of opportunities to settle, uh, we've got a great partner named Reagan who's kind of held us like, no, we're going to make the loudest thing we can. We're going to make the loudest thing we can. And, you know, getting pushed back from all these different manufacturers like, no, you can make this. You can make it for, you know, 20 bucks and it's already it's already ready to go. I was like, well, that's exactly it's already in the market. You know, that's not yeah. that's not what we're setting out to do. And so I think the fruit of those that goal setting is finally kind of coming to fruition that we made something great. And people are enjoying it. and We see it you know, and the smiles on our customers' faces. And uh, so, yeah, it's been it's been good. Well, you wanted to make the best for yourself. Yeah, exactly. So why not make the best for everyone else, right? Yeah, and I think, um, you yeah. know, there's, there's a lot of companies that do that. You know, throughout Yeti, that was one that inspired us a long time ago, seven years ago. That, yeah, you bring up Yeti yeah, a couple of times now. And it, it, it inspired us seven years ago, and I think seven years ago they were in, you know, a spot more like us that they were still young and growing and uh you know now they're super established but we were always inspired by their uh you know how they set themselves apart in price but also in quality like it, it was a very premium product yeah and um you know that's kind of what we wanted to be for the speaker business so yeah and uh, i know you said uh because i'm always in my head i'm trying to have the timeline here so everything started seven years ago and then only in the last four and a half? Yeah, so seven years ago, I say is when I made the first one in, in the garage. Um, this one that we're looking at, I mean, this is what I would call 
Gen One, you know, kind of our launch to market. Mm. So, you know, what you see, this we launched this product two and a half years ago, mm. and um, ah, two and a half years ago, that was yeah, the number I was yeah. looking for. So, so we're still a very young, yeah. young company, still growing. So um, that that first four and a half years, you guys were were making them out of your garage and selling to select individuals. Yeah, we're really a year doing that, and then once we kind of did, I would, I would call the garage phase a test market. Garage phase. Uh, the first one was again just for us. That was about a year process. Then we decided to let's make this a business. Mm-hmm. We launched in our garage, made the first fifty in our garage, sold them kind of around this time of year, around Christmas mm-hmm. time. Uh, family, friends, and to some random people that found out about us and uh, realized, all right, you know, this this could be a real business. People are willing to pay that sort of a premium for a speaker, and there's a niche here. And then we figured out how to get it mass manufactured. You know, how mm-hmm. do we go the next step? Yeah, the next step. And so there's a lot of hurdles there. You know, capital is a hurdle. Um, figuring out how to get it tooled and mass manufactured at, at a price that you can sell it for. Yeah, still make a profit. I mean, that's a a very big yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah of course. and uh you know starting out in this in this sort of bit we picked a very hard product to launch from scratch doing electronics i mean we a lot of things that we could have done like an iphone case or something that's one piece of plastic yeah and that could have been a lot easier but um um you know finding out finding the right manufacturer that can help achieve that vision there's a lot of there's just a lot of moving parts and we had mm-hmm. to learn all of them uh we could do it a lot faster now but you know, back then we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have yeah. a lot of time. We all had full time jobs, and but we had the vision. We had the idea, and um, the resourcefulness. Yeah, the resourcefulness to figure it out. But yeah. it was a, it took us two to three years to really make that happen. And the business probably almost died several times over. Oh wow! During that time, you know, cause it was you know it was a very hard, stressful time to get all that done. Yeah. What uh, what kept you guys going through those tough times? Um. One, we're all close friends, and I think we kept that a priority over the business. Like, you know, we really respect each other. We're closer friends now after going through, you know, this. I mean, it's a hard, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like being married together. We all, you know, we, <laughs> you know, we're all very close. And, uh, you know, yeah. so you know, going into business with friends is, is hard, uh, but it's also great. You know, if, if you can keep your friendship first, mm-hmm. uh, I think is really important. And it's made us better friends and, and also had a better business. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that got us through those hard times. And I think sticking to our goals, like, you know, we're not going to settle for less. And I think at each point, one of the partners carried, you know, would carry us through a harder time where, you know, depending yeah. what it was, like if it was a manufacturing deal, maybe somebody carried you know, that burden. And if it was a financial deal, maybe somebody carried that burden during that time. But we had plenty of hurdles to jump and, I think each of us kind of helped carry the load at some point or another. You're able to disperse the stress a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. And there's a lot of stress that comes with having four partners. We have four equal partners. Yeah. And we were all roommates and best friends and decided to go into business together. And, um, you know, that can be hard because there's four equal votes. <laughs> so sometimes yeah. it can be a split decision. And uh, <laughs> So I wouldn't recommend four as a number. I'd probably recommend three or, or an odd number. But. Uh, the the cool thing about four is that it's produced a really good product. Like we, mm. you know, we've poured over every detail of this and had four different opinions on everything. So it's hard to, it's harder to make a bad decision. Like yeah, you know, if it was just me driving the ship, this product would look a lot different. You know, it would, I would have done things differently or cut corners just to get it done. And you know, at, at some point, every partner has kind of carried the weight and said, "No, we gotta got to mm-hmm. do this right we got to make this cap waterproof or do the handle this way or whatever and so yeah you know a lot of things a lot of a lot of different opinions have gone into it uh so you know four is also good because it, it kind of sharpens each other if that makes sense yeah no i got you because when it's you're on the fence it's two and two yeah and yeah, definitely exactly. you got to go back to the drawing board yeah uh speaking of that the drawing board uh as you guys were making these different iterations one thing that I want to ask a little bit earlier was how did you maintain the integrity while trying new things? And, and how did you make sure that uh, if there was some sort of failure, you would make sure that that didn't affect your customer's experience in the sense that they can come back to you and, and you guys make it right? Yeah. I mean, uh, um, again, back to when we decided to make this a business, we rolled out our kind of like priorities on our business on the wall. Um, 
some of the ones that come to mind are keep it simple. Like if it's not a necessary thing, we don't want it on the box. Mm. So, you know, that one little idea, writing it on the wall saying, keep it simple, you know, really defined a lot of things on this box because we'd had so many people be like, oh, you got to put a bottle opener on this or you got to put a <laughs> AM FM radio or you got to do that. I mean, you know, if it's not necessary, you know, take it off the box. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for doing that. But one, you know, I think people appreciate a simple product. It's, mm. it's more intuitive. You know how to use it. Um, that was another thing that we kind of stuck to is we wanted the box to be intuitive. Like we wanted you to be able to look at it and just realize, one, what it is, two, how to use it. Um, so to back to your question, I mean, some of the things that kind of carried us in, through that would be the, the goal setting that we mm. did, and we stuck, we stuck to it, um, making it the loudest that it can possibly be. And so, anyway. Yeah, that seems to be the trend, loudest and sturdiest. Yeah, loudest and sturdiest. And, and simple, keeping it simple is a really good design motto. Mm-hmm. Uh, we kind of stole that one from Steve Jobs with Apple. Like, you know, he was all about, and you can still see it in everything they do, but, you know, yeah. keep, it, keep it simple, clean lines, you know. Uh, a lot of features doesn't necessarily mean less features, but it's, you know, it's right. simple. It's simple in design and uh, kind of less is more idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, features-wise, definitely a very complex iPhone now. Right, but, uh, right, right. But, but it's still very, you know, they actually, they've actually taken buttons off. You know? Yeah. So while there's more features now, it's all like more software-related, you know, yeah. less hardware. And so like there's actually less, it's just a big screen now like where there used yeah. to be a big button. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. It's actually simpler and simpler over time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eventually it's just going to be, uh, you're not even going to touch it. It's just going to be eventually with our just mind. Eventually going to input a chip yeah. in our brain or something, right? Did you hear about <laughs> that with uh, Elon? Yeah, I did, yeah. Oh, man, wild. Uh, I don't know, side tangent, I don't know if you are a Joe Rogan fan at all. Yeah, yeah, I watched some of his podcasts. There's um, Alex Jones uh, is definitely a character. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's on he's on one of the more recent ones, and they talk about those those neural implants. It's uh, it gets pretty wild. I'll have to go yeah. l- check that out. Yeah, we're not putting one of those in here, by the way. It doesn't no. listen to you. There's no Alexa in there. <laughs> oh, awesome, that's good. That's it's not good. spying on you when you leave it in your house. So, you're so that's good. one thing you guys know that Turtle Box is uh, spy proof. So yeah, no, it does not uh, spy on you. So there's no hidden camera, no microphones. But but hey, uh. The marketing's definitely uh, on point because I clicked on your website and now it's yeah. straight in my feed now. Uh, yeah. Where did you, um, where, before I go into marketing, uh, a question I wanted to ask before that I kind of spurred there was uh, when you did need to do the next steps to get to manufacturing and did need that capital, what did that process look like? In, in, because I'm sure that's yeah. something you never dealt with. Yeah, it was something new and uh, a very enjoyable process. We have a great investor. Uh, funny his story. He actually bought one of the first fifty we made out of our garage. Oh, so very he was cool. A very early fan, and uh, you know he's one of the guys that actually carried us during some hard times too. He's really believed in us since day one, and uh, you know I'd see him almost as much of a mentor as I would an investor. So, mm. you know, during some of these harder seasons where sales weren't where they where we want them to be, or getting it originally produced, you know, he's always been there like cheering us on and hey, you guys, you know, you guys got this. This is a great product. It's done great. You know, we're going this is gonna be huge. He's always he's always said that, you know, this is gonna sell for way more than you ever think it's going to. So yeah. I mean he's he's believed in us since day one. Um and just been a big fan of the business. So that made that process a little bit easier. But um you know that was a that was a uh a hard step, you know, raising that capital to get the tooling done and get the first PO placed. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, because up until then, even though we'd been at it for a while, it was still very much a garage, you know, mm. garage based yeah. prototype. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, having somebody believe in us from day one was, was, was important, but you know, that's a hard, that's a hard step and a hard pitch to make. You know? yeah, uh, yeah. It was, it was a cool day when we, when we got that deal signed and got the, you know, got a check and placed the PO. Uh, it was a very scary time, but also yeah. very, very, very cool. You know, something I'll never forget. And so, and he stayed on us ever, you know, even as we've done additional raises, he's, he's wanted as much as he can get. He's still our original and only investor. Yeah. You know, as we've ramped the business up and, and, and grown and placed bigger and bigger orders, you know, he's, he's stepped up and is still 
been there for every bit of it. Still yeah. believes in us. And, uh, you know, I think that's really important. I've heard horror stories where guys have had bad, you know, partnerships mm -hmm. on the capital side. And, um, you know, again, a partnership, like I said, is kind of like a marriage. And whether it's your day-to-day -day working partners or if it's even your capital partners, you know, you're kind of getting in bed together. So you mm -hmm. really got to trust the people that you work with on the partnership side and on the capital side. Like, you know, you don't, yeah. you want someone that believes in you. Um, you want someone that holds you accountable, but you don't want someone that's looking over your shoulder and, you know, you're reporting to weekly, but um, you want someone that believes in the product and believes in yeah. the brand. And so I feel like that's one of the things that's helped carry us through as well. Yeah. I think that's probably one of the best things as an investor to go into because they're not, they're investing in the product, but they're also investing in you. And, yeah. And uh, you guys uh, have this ideal of bringing forth, a very valuable experience to the customer. I think uh, I actually uh, hearing this story more and more. Uh, you you guys kind of remind me of North Face a little bit. Oh, there we go. Uh, That's a big compliment. Yeah, because <laughs> it's like I always saw that brand as you know yeah. they wanted that value because the CEO is out there in Antarctica sometimes using the same thing. Right, <laughs> he right, he knows yeah. how it is, you know. Yeah. So that's a, that's always I always thought that was a cool pairing. Yeah, what's well, authentic to the brand? I mean, yeah. they use it. And it's, it's anyway. Yeah, we're we're the same. Yeah. Oh, super cool, man. Uh, back to marketing. By the way, I, yeah. I put a pin in that. But um, uh, something I see a lot through my Facebook feed is these just insanely comical videos. Uh, I've seen I've seen what have come through. I feel like. You mean like on the stories, like the things that disappear in 24 hours or whatever oh no 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 the uh if you're looking through your facebook feed yeah, uh, yeah. like purple mattress was one right 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 always yeah. just insane um yeah. i feel like turtle box could have some mm. production like that what are you guys doing right now and do you foresee anything that might be able to grab attention yeah, like that in the future that's a good question um you know we've learned a lot over marketing um we've outsourced it we've taken it back in-house during COVID, we actually took pretty much all of it back in house, and uh, we found that to be a pretty big blessing for us because we've gotten to engage with our customers. And yeah. before we knew that our sales were actually going to spike during COVID, we kind of prepared for the worst and right. cutting costs. And yeah, cut costs, but also said, all right, we're really going to invest in our customers, like get to know them, you know, write them personal notes if they tag us for something, you know, try to reach out to them and get to know our customers, mm -hmm. find out how they like in the product. And so. Uh, you know, marketing from that standpoint and taking back our social media and things like that has been a good, a good fit on the marketing side. We've really seen that, that pay dividends. Um, you know, as far as, as, uh, as far as comical ads and things like that, you know, I, you know, we have uh, the four partners are a pretty fun group and we, <laughs> we do a lot of dumb and really fun stuff. We yeah. try to, you know, capturing that and, and putting it on a video is, is a little bit harder than it sounds. Yeah. Um, Except for the stuff that's actually like very organic, like filming it with your phone. Yeah, I feel like the the average consumer actually wants to see that and will listen to that or watch that a little bit longer than they will something that's super produced. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And so, like some of the things that we've paid outside groups to film or do actually have less views than you know me just like holding up my phone and filming. Yeah some of our antics, you know, on a camping trip or something like Yeah, that's very that's very cool. So, we've we've seen a lot of organic marketing, so to speak in that regard, mm -hmm. um empowering some of our brand ambassadors to, you know, to right. to do that and put it on our social media. You know, I think that goes a long way. Um, so, anyway. How do you pick a brand ambassador, by the way? That's always curious uh, to me. Yeah, that's a good it's it's been a um it's been a hit or miss kind of deal. We've you know, when we first started, you know, I was begging people to try out the product and yeah. post about it. And now it's the opposite. You know, we've got people, you know, several people will reach out daily, you know, wanting a, a free product. Now everybody's an ambassador, right? Like everybody's an influencer and it's, yeah. it's a little bit annoying. Gonzalo's um, an influencer. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but finding the right guy is actually really cool. And so like it goes back to relationships. Like I want every customer to be an ambassador, right? I mean, uh, and I want every ambassador to be more of a relationship. Like I don't want paid ambassadors. Um, I, you know, I have paid people for content, but, um, 
what I tell people is I want them to naturally try the product, use mm -hmm. it, and if it's something you fall in love with, like you know, let's yeah, you know, let, let's engage and have a long working relationship. You know, if I need something, I could pay you for something specific. But, yeah, you know, I kind of like building long term relationships. Yeah, and um, you know, that's that's harder to find. I mean, you you tr you find it through trial and error, and and now I feel like we're finding more of those relationships, like people that love the product. And now it's more word of mouth. Like, Oh, you need to go talk to this guy or this guy. And yeah. And, uh, and I think people find out about, about us now versus the other way around. I mean, it's, you know, kind of filtering yeah. people out and seeing if, if they're a good fit. Um, so some people were generally attracted to this product already. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, uh, have an, I, I have an idea for a highly produced, now that we've been talking, so I think, Come on. I think this could be hilarious. Uh, you got someone campsite or a couple guys or whatever. They got the uh, turtle box just banging. Of course, uh, I'm thinking like '80s love ballads. Oh yeah, love, maybe love and, some '80s. And then all of a sudden, uh, this would obviously be a very expensive commercial. Bear comes in, scares <laughs> him off, like rummages, and it gets caught on the bear. So you see him going through. The river, catching oh, salmon, yeah, yeah, everything. Yeah. And then it's like playing the whole album, like different cuts of the different songs <laughs> of the album. And then he comes back, comes to another campsite, scares him off, runs away, but it drops. Oh, and then good. one of the guy picks like it that, up. I like that, man. That's pretty Maybe, good. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> that's pretty good, actually. Yeah. I'll run that by our video Turtle guy, box, bear proof. If he, if he thinks it can happen. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a lot. I think you need I don't know how we tape it to the bear, but just that, like trying to... Trying to film that commercial might end up being pretty good in of itself. Like yeah, having yeah. the guy like trying to tape it to the bear yeah. or whatever. Because you can have like a over like as long as you have an over the top fake bear. Oh yeah, it will work because That's like you either have very very real yeah, or you yeah. have obviously fake. Right, right, right. right yeah, <laughs> and then uh, and then you could just do it. Anyways, I don't know. No, that's a good idea, man. I'm all about it. We've got a great video guy here, and so I can ask him. If that's something he hey, thinks man. he can pull off. If if he if he can pull that off, uh, I'd like an audition to be the bear. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty awesome. But but man, yeah, that's uh that's that's pretty cool that you guys have brought it in house and we're able to continue to make those relationships. I think that's uh something that's 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 missing a lot, especially with B to uh, business to consumer. Right. Is it's just like especially mass produced. It's just getting it out there um and you guys i'm assuming had to learn marketing for that from scratch yeah from scratch we've we've had some great people partner with us we've um, worked with a lot of other brands you know especially in the outdoor space and kind of sharing ideas you know how did you do this or what's working for you now because the marketing space is continually changing i mean it's changed a lot just in the last three months yeah and so you know how yeti grew is different than how we can grow because mm -hmm. the climate has changed so much in seven years yeah and so and we're also a primarily direct to consumer business so you know finding out how best to reach our our customer um and primarily we've been on social media you know facebook instagram and uh you know, google are kind of the obvious ones mm -hmm. but there's less obvious ones there's a you know like right now during christmas christmas season you know your same dollar doesn't get you as many views and so we found out last yeah. year that Man, Facebook and Instagram during holiday season, we just don't get much bang for our buck. And so Please trying stop. to find out this year how to do things a little bit different. We're util utilizing some different tactics like, you know, um, different giveaways with different brands, you know, might get you the same amount of views and it costs you just the cost of one box versus yeah, yeah. it could be a couple thousand dollars to get those same amount of views. And so thinking a little bit yeah. outside the box to still get, you know, reach a new audience. Um, we've done a lot of giveaways since COVID. Um, one to uh, kind of do give back to our customers and but also to you know get brand awareness and yeah hopefully have people hear about us that haven't heard about us before um, so we plan to do that you know between now and in the holidays and um, and do some different things you know we're trying to do a little bit more uh, print media like get in some magazines yeah. that you know we really haven't done in the past and so yeah. go back to traditional marketing that yeah that's you know, true a lot of people don't do as much anymore yeah they, so. they definitely don't well a lot of people aren't really reading magazines yeah kind of kind of not tough. many magazines out there that are still in circulation there's a lot yeah. that you know have an online or digital presence but 
you know, there's still a lot of people that read. Oh yeah, too. there's a lot of stuff. I thought um, I, I thought for myself, and I I, I keep pushing this off something that could be done is, is snail mail is not used that much but if you have right. a direct if you have a mailer it's right. going to get thrown away right so you got to have something that's not only personalized but it's interesting yeah so i always thought just for any company myself included if you could combine digital with snail mail where you send something via yeah. fedex and it's just a big old sheet of paper with a qvc code that says scan me mm. and nothing else yeah. Is the person just not going to scan it? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know? Yeah, I mean, if it just had scanned me, I'd probably think they were like going to steal all my bank account info or something. Yeah, <laughs> but, maybe. Yeah, that's true. I didn't no, think that a, through. It's a great idea. And uh, that's something we actually did during all this COVID season was like, I want to write people handwritten letters. You know, because, you know, direct mail, yeah, mailers, people are going to throw it away. But if you see an envelope with an actual stamp and a handwritten address, yeah. like, I got to open it. I, gotta, I mean, yeah, somebody yeah. wrote that. And so opening it. Not the fake handwriting. Not the fake handwriting, like my handwriting. And it's very time consuming, but every handwritten note, you know, I wrote to somebody like, they were like, oh my gosh, you know, they post on their feed. And, you know, I think that's, again, we'll just give it back. Yeah. yeah, They'll get, you're trying to gain those relationships, not just, Mm -hmm. not just a customer, not just a sale. Uh, You know, I wish I could write every single person a handwritten note because I think that goes a long way and it's kind of a lost tradition. Yeah. It's a lot. Over ten thousand. Yeah, <laughs> so that'd be a lot. But anyway. Well, yeah, I got got always try to f- figure out more ways to get it. Uh, um, one last question I had. Uh, speaking of being in more markets, I saw. So you guys are in the major retailers, right? No, we're not. No? We're okay. we're in I retail. For sure. uh, we're not. Well, when you say major, we're not in any big box. Um, okay. Not we, yet. We haven't. Not yet. Yeah, not yet. There's probably only one or two that we would like to be in. Um, but right now we're just kind of focusing on. Bass, Bass Pro Shop? Yeah, Bass Pro and, and Academy would probably be two one. on our list that because you know, they're outdoor retailers, they're not, yep. you know, just in electronics or whatever. What uh, uh what would it take to get in there, you think? Um, we're in talks with, with one or two of them. You know, Bass Pro we've I haven't really reached out to directly, but um, uh, you know, there's somebody that we would love to have a, a longer term relationship with. There's like uh I think they only have three stores. In Texas, fish and tackle. Well, and and you know they bought uh, Cabela's, oh. so every Cabela's is a Bass Pro, and, and vice oh. versa. They can sell each other's goods, and so there, you know, there's well, well there's, no, I meant there's there's like a literally, I think another bigger type store that's only Texas based called Fish and Tackle or something like that. Uh, yeah, Field and Stream. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah, that's that's tied to Dick Sporting Goods. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, never mind. I just yeah yeah just yeah. spitballing at that. No, Bass Pro's a great one. Cabela's, you know, we've thought about REIs of the world that are, you know, they're more camping and outdoorsy. Yeah, um, you know, those would probably be the big box guys that we would lean towards. But other than that, we've really wanted to grow mom and pop. Um, you know, I think they, that's more of the relationship where right. big box is. You know, it's. You know, I've got friends that work for some of these, and they're like, "Man, you we." Once we sign a deal, we kind of become your enemy. Like, you know, we're, we yeah. butt heads. We want to tell you how much to sell it for and, and oh, give you, uh, you know, how your packaging wants to be. But, uh, deal, but with, deal with the devil. Yeah, but they're, they're great at what they do. And, you, you know, sell, move a lot of units, but your margins are slim. Mm-hmm. It's a volume game. Um, uh, you know, the boutique retailers really become relationships. You know, most of them, I try to talk to them on the phone and mm-hmm. be able to, they have my cell phone and we can talk if there's any yeah, issues really and cool. things like that so you know the the boutique retailers almost become like a customer as well they become yeah, a long-term of course. relationship another so, channel yeah, yeah. And so we've got some great retailers in houston bearings is one that's been great gordian sons and uh, we've got a couple new ones we just got a woman's store called magpies oh cool and they've been selling a ton of boxes i never thought we'd be in a woman's <laughs> store but it's like they're, oh that's the great it's the perfect gift you know for you know, our loved ones, we never know what to get dad or yeah. our husbands. And so the turtle box has been a big hit there. So anyways, yeah, we're trying to grow uh, our re- our boutique retailer presence, you know, but for us, the bread and butter is direct to consumer because yeah. we get to, we get to develop that relationship with the customer and we get to keep their information, their email address. We can stay in touch with them. Mm-hmm. You know, if we sell to a retailer, we never, we don't know who bought it. Right. Yeah. Um, and so again, it's, we want to develop a lifetime product, but you know, hopefully they become a customer for life. They buy them for their friends or families or tell right, people right. about them. So, 
and we really try to engage with our customers. Yeah. So Turtle Box continually trying to make the loudest, toughest, and uh simplest. Yeah, simplest, that's right. Simplest, all of it together and making sure that uh a customer is a friend in, instead of just a number, huh? That's right, man. I lo- relationships. I love it. Relationships I love first, it. whether it's your your partners or the customer. Yeah. The values important. and relationships. Yeah. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. Well, I think I'm gonna wrap it up there, man. Cool. I appreciate you coming on, Will. Yeah, uh time. you guys can find Turtle Box uh Turtle turtleboxaudio.com. Yeah, that's right. At Turtlebox Audio on both Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, but barely there. Uh <laughs> so uh get yourself a turtle box, be the hero of the day on the beach uh as we start to get out of COVID more and more. And uh, you know, go from uh zero to hero real quick. But uh hope you guys enjoyed the show. Any questions? For Will, just shoot him down below uh, or hit him up on Facebook. I'm sure he'd be happy to answer there. Uh, you can always find Texas Tea on uh, YouTube, of course. Uh, also on Facebook, Texas Tea Podcast, Instagram. And uh, I keep saying this, and, and God, it sucks to, to say this like four times and not have started it yet. Because <laughs> already, already knows. On TikTok as well, uh, with zero content, we'll be there, we'll be there soon. Uh, but just remember, guys, uh, Texas business tastes the sweetest on Texas tea. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks, man. That was great.